Okay, well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Kerner. I'm a General Motors World Class Certified Technician. I specialize in the care and service of Corvette. Now, let's be very clear. I, I work on the entire General Motors product line. I am one of 11 technicians nationwide certified in compressed natural gas and propane-powered vehicles as well as the hybrids, the diesels, and everything else. Uh, I am fully trained by General Motors in all aspects of vehicle service, no matter what it is. My playtime is with my Corvettes. Let's be very, very specific with that. Uh, I have a lot of fun doing it, but I find it critical to understand that the technology within Corvette comes from every single vehicle in the General Motors line. It, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a 2000 Malibu or you're talking about a 1953 solid axle. Every single vehicle within the General Motors product line had something to do with the evolution and therefore the production that the technology advancements, the technological advancements that have happened over time. I'm lucky I get to do all of it. I have a good time. And, and as you will know, you will see that I just, I love what I do. I absolutely love it. So without any further ado, let us get started with this. Uh, please excuse my hoarseness. I'm still kind of getting over a little bit of a throat thing. Getting the most from your Corvette. I think the big thing that people don't really understand is what is performance? What is it that you're trying to get out of your Corvette? Is it that you're looking for, maybe you're looking for a more comfortable ride. Maybe you're looking for more aggressive handling. Maybe you want more power. Maybe you want it to accelerate faster. What if? Key thing is, is that there's not one answer for everybody. You might want to have the transmission shift a little bit differently. You might want to have it get more, better fuel mileage. You might want to be able to take it out on the track and make it do more on the track. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. We want to make the Corvette your own and do everything in its power to make it what you want it to be. You know, we talk about a brake pedal. We talk about a smoother ride. Maybe we're just talking about a little bit of a better exhaust note really doesn't matter. What matters is, is the car what you want it to be? So you're getting the most out of your car, but to your taste. Not mine as a service technician, not to another Corvette owner. It's your car. We want to make it the best for you. That's why this came to be. Okay, and with that, I'm just going to say this. Let's, let's try and uh, let's kill these things so that way we don't have to worry about anything. I'm as guilty of it as anybody. Sorry. Oh, no, no, no. Believe me. There's always, it always happens once or twice. It always does. That's why we, I throw them away. I really wish I could live without it. I swear to God. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh, I, oh, believe me. The problem is my job won't go on. That's the problem. Oh, my goodness. All right, back to subject matter. It starts with maintenance. And the reason why I say this is people, they tend to think of bolt-on modifications as going to make your car better. Not always the case. Simple maintenance like brake fluid, you know, whether it's super lube for adjusting doors or lubricating weather strips, a lot of it is basic maintenance. Synthetic lubricants changed at regular intervals. Now, depending on what we have here, how many own a, a fourth gen? Okay, fifth gen? Sixth gen? New Stingray. Okay, so we've got four generations here, right guys? Four, five, six, and seven here. Anybody earlier than a fourth gen? Okay, okay, what do you got, sir? 66. Okay, you? 59 and 66. So really, we're covering six out of seven generations here. But these theories remain the same. You know, synthetic lubricants, even on your 59 and your 66, while maybe they're not quite right for you because of seal design over time, things like that, still, maybe you're using synthetic lubricant in your rear diff. 
Solid axle, I wouldn't have a problem with that. I go to a 66 with an independent rear suspension, I'd still go synthetic. I'd put the Posilock, uh, the transaxle, the, the uh, Positraction additive in there. But regardless of that, still would change it on a regular basis. Absolutely. Effective filtration of air, fuel, and oil. I want to be very clear about something. A lot of people like to go with Mobile One filters or k and air filters and things like that. That's not going to hurt you as long as you do it per guidelines of the manufacturer. Don't put a lot of engine oil, uh, don't put a lot of filter oil on the air filters. Don't overly saturate it. That's a key part to this, but it'll still work well. But let's also think about the GM paper filters that come with the vehicles. Those GM paper filters are engineered for the power, the reliability of the cars of the day. Whether it is a mid-year, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh generation. Those filters are all designed to give you maximum power and maximum reliability with good service intervals. Alignment and balancing of tires. This is one of the reasons why I came up and brought, picked off these two tires and brought them out here. We must understand that tires, you got what, maybe a one foot square contacting the road at four corners. If those tires are not aligned correctly, your ride quality will get really bad going around corners. You might not be able to accelerate as well. Your braking might actually suffer because of an alignment problem or a tire problem that's not correct. We all get into this. Top tier fuels. Those of you who know me know to go and take a look at this website, toptiergas.com. Every major automotive manufacturer to present date, this is including Porsche, BMW, Bugatti, Aston Martin, Rolls, Ferrari, you name it. All of these vehicles are now, all these manufacturers are now recommending top tier fuels. Now what is top tier fuel? It is simply a detergency spec. It cleans the inside of your engine better. So whether you've got an 82 Crossfire, you've got a mechanical fuel leak from the mid-years. I don't care, even going back to solid axle with those mechanicals. I would want a fuel, cyst, a fuel that cleans better. That's what I would want. That's the reason why I recommend that course of action. Understanding your maintenance guide in your owner's manual. Now, the reason why I say that is because most of us, let's say if you're talking fourth, fifth, sixth, you get an owner's manual like this, right? This should be your Bible as far as maintenance. Reason why I say that is if you open this up, you go in, in every single owner's manual at the back, service and maintenance, service and maintenance, it's in every single one. And it will give you the part numbers of all the different usable parts, spark plugs, air filters, Fuel filters, if you have them prior to 2003, you won't have a fuel filter after that, okay? But you look at them, and they have your information. I mean, even if, uh, it was funny, too. I was going through the archives down at the NCM last week, or back at the uh, 20th anniversary. Even back in the 60s, they had maintenance schedules in the back of their owner's manuals. Even back to the 60s. So the information is there. Now, your second order of business is somebody like me. Big mouth, likes to talk a lot. Just saying. But ask me questions. That's why you're here, right? That's why you're here. You want to ask questions. You want to get answers. That's why we're here. Fuel, fact and fiction. Octane is not an accurate indication of quality of fuels. It is only a measurement of burning capability. The higher octane, the more resistance to burning. The reason why I mention this is back to the top tier gas, okay? Because top tier gas, you can get it in 87, 89, 93, 91, doesn't matter. If they are a top tier fuel classified, no matter what octane rating you get, you're good. Now remember, let's talk up to 1991. Your specification was, you could use any type of gasoline, 
But then when ZR1 came out with the LT5 in 1990, 89.90, that spec went to 91 octane, right? LT1 in 92, you were still at the 91 octane or better. Now you can use the lower octanes, but it won't give you as much power. So this is part of the getting the most out of your Corvette. Your octane rating will help you get more power, okay? Just a thought. But that does not mean it's going to clean any better if you don't get a top tier fuel. That's the reason why the low quality fuels contribute to carbon buildup and other deposits related with concerns with engines. Look at the top tier gas for your latest updates. It was just updated less than three months ago. And now BP's on that list. Uh, who's another one that was, that was new? Costco gas. Costco wholesale clubs, and I don't know if you have them out here. Even some of the wholesale clubs are actually now top tier classified. Fuel injection cleaning, rough idle when you start it cold. This is the reason why I tell people, because when you start it cold, if you have a computer controlled car, when you start it up cold, it's running off a predetermined cal. So if you have restricted fuel injectors, you'll get a rough idle. But then as the oxygen sensor starts to work, it'll smooth out. Cold start is your most critical thought to this, okay guys, ladies? Cold start. When you start it cold, how does it act, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Have you noticed some hesitation on acceleration? Certainly, fueling systems cleaner will be part of that, okay? Something like the Redline fuel system cleaner will help you. We also know about Chevron Tecra which is used among all major automotive manufacturers, Ford, Chrysler, GM. They're all recommending using the Tecron now because it works. It's that simple. Clutch hydraulic fluid. I say this because we are having more and more problems with clutch systems when people are not maintaining them by using the new fresh clutch fluid. Now, this was a mandate brought down by General Motors on the sixth generation, but this can go all the way back to 1984. Okay, 1984, we're going all the way back there. GM revised service recommendations to two years or 24,000 miles. Blue Super DOT clutch fluid is the correct fluid for this application. I want to amend that, okay? I want to amend that because now Super Blue is no longer available, thanks to our good buddy Skeet over here. Type 200 is the new fluid available from ATE. It's a DOT4. Federal Motor Vehicle Guidelines basically took the blue color off the shelf, okay? So now, Type 200, that's what we're using, okay? The General Motors part number, I'll put that up later, is also the 1929-9570, okay? That's the GM part number. And that's also a DOT4 clutch fluid that's very, very good. This does not mean that you simply flush, the, remove the fluid in the master cylinder. You must flush the entire system. How many of us have manual transmissions? At least 50% of the room. So this applies to all of you, okay? All of you. Two years, 30,000 miles. I don't care if you drive 1,000 miles a year. You still need to change it every two years, okay? Moisture buildup. You are not looking for a darkness in the fluid. You are looking for a, like a whitish slime that deposits when moisture mixes with the fluid. It'll be black. That's okay. Don't think just because the color change means that you need to. Okay? One bottle can do both clutch and braking systems. That's why I like the one liter bottle so much. I flush the braking system. I flush the clutch system. This one bottle does it all. I say this because of the following. Brake fluid, clutch fluid, is not only to transmit power of you stepping on the pedal. It is also a lubricant. It lubricates your O-ring seals. It lubricates all those micro passages within the ABS module. This is a lubricant as well as power transfer device, okay? That's the reason why, another reason why, I recommend you changing it. Brake fluid. DOT3 brake fluid is the, is the correct fluid to use for your braking system. Now, DOT4 brake fluid may be used as this is simply a higher boiling point fluid and is better suited for racing applications. 
skeet. Only because he likes to race. There is nothing wrong with racing your Corvette. In fact, I encourage it. Because that's what these cars were engineered for. How many people like to track? How many people want to track but haven't yet? Thank you very much. You're talking three quarters of the room wants to take their vehicle on a track. That's what they were made for. They were made for getting on a racetrack and going as hard and as fast as you want. Here's a, reason, here's a clue that GM thinks the same way. Stingray is no longer warranted void if you put it on the track. They still back it. Short of impact damage, you could take that car anywhere you want to go. You want to go on the track? You want to do road course down at the NCM in that, that beautiful new motorsports park? Do it. Your warranty is not going to be void. Do it. It's that simple. Do not use silicone DOT5 brake fluid. People try to put that in. Now, prior to 1984, you could use it. The silicone brake fluid was okay. But not any, 1984 to present day, do not use DOT5 at all. It doesn't mesh with the seals within it, causes the seals to expand, and then you've got easily a $5,000 repair if you're talking about Stingray. Model 84 to present day, yes. You don't. Yes, yes. Anything C1, C2, C3, you're fine. C4 and up, don't do it. Okay? Change fluid every two years, 24,000 miles to keep hydraulic system at its best. You can go 230 just like the clutch, like we talked about. Okay, 224 is kind of what people have been talking about recently. That is the new GM part number. Okay? This is the ATE Blue, which is no longer in production. This is the new stuff, Type 2. Okay? And, and thankfully, he actually, Skeet actually brought it and said, look, I found some. And, but you want to know something? That's what this kind of stuff is all about. Sometimes I can't get to the information because I've got so many other things to cover. The, the, the part number there? The GM part number is 1929-9570. And that bottle is actually went from 8.45 ounces to 16 ounces. And it's the same price. Ten bucks. Yeah, weird, isn't it? Braking performance. How many, likes, how many people like brakes that give them whiplash? Oh, yeah, I do. I expect to touch it with one toe and I expect to slow down very fast. We talk about brakes because brakes and tires are safety condition are safety systems. I think so at least. I want to know that they're at their best. Cross drilled or slotted rotors offer the benefit of venting gases when the pads get hot. Essentially, basically, you get them hot, everything steams off vapor, right? You get something hot, you're going to smell something. Well, cross drilled and slotted rotors basically allow that gas to evaporate so you don't get brake fade. Allows that gas to escape, so no brake fade. Cross-drilled rotors are quieter, but slotted rotors clean the pads better. Cross-drilled rotors, I like them, but people would get a little bit nervous with the cracks in them. So some people like slotted rotors better. Either is an excellent choice for the cars that are raced at the track. Basically, better braking system efficiency. They work better the hotter they get. Now, we are not talking about the carbon ceramic matrix. Okay, we'll cover that. Pads are always a compromise between noise, performance, and dust. Now, I see a couple of you here who are Grand Sport owners. Raise your hands. That's right. We all know about the brake dust issue with Grand Sport. That is because you are talking about a racing braking system. And I have to be specific with this. When you have a racing brake pad, you're talking about a compromise. Whether you want the brake dust, but you want it to really grip hard on the track, that's the compromise you got to deal with. Okay? But if you're talking about the other side, you go to something like a base FE1 braking system with no drills or no slots, they don't dust as much. But they don't brake as well either. Okay? Then you talk about the carbon ceramic matrix. ZR1, Z06 carbon, 
New Stingray with the Z07 package and Z06? Oh, yeah. I want me some of that. Well, because think about it. How many times have you guys heard of anybody doing a ZR1 brake job? Have you heard of any? That's because carbon ceramic matrix, if you don't put that thing on the track, you're talking about lifetime brakes, ladies and gentlemen. I have ZR1 customers with 70,000 miles and have not even touched their brakes yet. Um, ceramics can do wonders for you. If you use a ceramic braking system versus a carbon matrix, it's kind of a little bit different. So you're talking about a brake resin that has a high ceramic content. Um, I'm trying to think of the correct terminology because I don't want to mislead you here. Durastop makes a ceramic brake pad. And we'll just leave it as ceramic brake pad, okay? And they're the padlets and they've got them. And actually, I do know that MidAmerica has them here. I can, if you stop back tomorrow, I can show you the actual pad kit. Uh, I'll actually have them pull me a set. Ceramics are very good because they don't dust very much at all. They don't. The downside to it is the ceramics are slightly harder. So because they're slightly harder, they wear the brake rotor a little bit more. Okay? So it's kind of like a trade-off. That's that trade-off that you're talking about. So if you want lower brake dust, that probably would be what you're looking for. Headers, long tube versus short tube. A lot of us talk about headers. What is the difference between it? Obviously, 6th gen, 5th gen gets a little bit touchy because you have to change the headers. You also have to change the catalytic converters. That leads to emission control problems. Leads to check engine lights. We've all experienced that to a certain amount. What is the difference in horsepower? What is the difference in torque? Short tube headers create better off-idle throttle response and better torque off-idle. That's up to about 2,000 RPM. Long tube headers create high horsepower gains at high RPMs, but they will also sacrifice torque down low. So long tube headers, better high RPM horsepower, but not as good throttle response at the low RPM, okay? Remember the difference. Stainless steel is always more durable than ceramic coated, but is always more expensive. So remember, if you're going to be going in and getting headers, always remember, get stainless steel, always. It's always a better option for longer durability over time. These are stainless steel. Now, everybody thinks stainless steel is always shiny, it always looks great. No, heat will change. This is stainless steel, but the heat has changed it to like a off, kind of, I don't know what you would call it, like maybe a copperish type of look to it. What was that? Bronze. bronze. Okay, there you go, bronze, bronze. Okay, we got everybody nodding now, ah, yeah. Bronze is, is, okay, that's a good way to describe it. Does that mean it's bad? No, absolutely not. It means that it's coloring the way it's supposed to. Now, this is on a fifth gen because you can see the wing oil pan right there. And all the tubes come down into a collector down here. Headers create better, RP, better airflow at higher RPM. That's what they do. We're talking about long tube headers here. And that's why the long tube, usually the catalytic converter's right here. Well, not with long tube headers. That's where they have to change things in order to make it work. That's where the check engine lights come in. Air filters, oiled or not oiled? A lot of people have this debate constantly. You see the K&Ns. You've seen the green air filters. You've seen all these other ones. They can be used without a problem, but... It is when people over-oil them that the problems are starting to be created. Factory filters are excellent for long-term with no maintenance. Basically, 30,000 miles on 5th, 6th, and 7th generation, more so on 7th gen because you've got this big, huge cone filter. You could get 70,000, 80,000 miles out of, a, out of one of those air filters. 6th generation, specifically Z06, ZR1, I'm changing them at 50,000 miles. But... Oiled, oiled air filters are not the, as restrictive as hi, at high RPM. Basically, less filter area, air flows through it easier. It's that simple. The oil, the, as the dirt comes through, the oil basically suspends the particles before they get to the engine. Now, 
do not oil them too much, as this can create reliability issues with the mass airflow sensors. If your mass airflow sensor gets contaminated, you could create problems with how the air fuel ratio is met. So we don't want to do that, okay? Just a couple of squirts, and once you clean it, well, I usually tell my customers, you clean your air filter, it's nice and white, right? Then take the oil, one, two, three, four sprays across the air filter and let it sit. You will literally see that red oil wick its way through the filter. It'll wick its way through. Let it sit and watch it wick through. That's all you need to do. That's it. Don't go anymore because then that oil is going to get sucked through and hit the mass airflow sensor and stay there. Okay? Mass airflow sensor coated with oil creates issues such as idle surging and incorrect power output. That's why oiling it correctly is so critical if you decide to use a K&N. Now we get into handling and cornering. How many people like to corner fast? Oh yeah. Oh, I'm all over that. I have a lot of fun doing that because that's what Corvette was engineered to do. They were not engineered as drag cars, except for the solid axle. But independent rear suspension, they're engineered to corner like it's on rails. And if you set it up correctly, you can. Tires are part of that, right? Anti-sway bars are your biggest factor to cornering. Maybe I shouldn't have put it that way. Anti-sway bars are a big factor in that. Not the biggest, but a big factor. Shock absorbers affect up and down motion, not vehicle lean into corners. You get a stiffer shock, it's not really going to help you in cornering, but what it will do is prohibit the up and down fast motion when you're going over bumps, right? We don't want undulation. We want it over the bump, straighten out. That's what we want shock absorbers to do. That's why magnetic ride control works so well. Tires with less than 50% tread will not grip as well. What I mean is... You're talking about treads. You're talking about tread wear. See these little humps right here? These are your tread wear indicators, okay? Now, what I mean by that is tires with less than 50% tread wear will not channel the water away. How many of us like to drive in the rain? Nobody, huh? Maybe it's your tires. Ladies and gentlemen, tires are such a critical factor to no matter what you, how you handle. It is a critical factor to this. I like to get close and personal, so I'm going to fold up some of these chairs. Or just move them out of the way. The reason why I say that is this. Tires channel water. Tires, tires contact the road. But tires also squirm when you try to corner. So as you corner, the sidewall will distort a little bit because the treads stick so well to the ground, right? But if you don't have water channeling capability, like the tread design here in this Yokohama, you could be like you're on F1 supercars and slide sideways in the rain. Yeah, you know that all too well, don't you? Uh-huh. Yeah, he's not as said. He's like, yeah, that was me. But the point I'm trying to make is tire design is everything when handling. It's everything. You get a tire that's designed for track usage, right? Or all season where you're going in the rain. Or Stingray owners, did you know that there's a snow tire out? <laughs> no way. <laughs> way. Michelin Alpen Sports. Corvette Engineering was validating them last year when we were up at Corvettes in the D in Detroit. You better believe it. My first experience with snow tires was a 1998 commemorative um, Indy Pace car. They had me mount the F1 mud and snows on it. Run flat capability. I was running around in six inches of snow with a 1998 convertible. Oh yeah, I had fun. <laughs> but I never got stuck. And I made it through all the snow without a problem. You can do it. If your tires are everything to how your vehicle, you want a better ride? Take the run flats off, go to a soft sidewall. Okay? Very simple. Sp uh, right, exactly. It's a downs, it's still a compromise. 
You know, run flat versus non-run flat, still a compromise. But all of these things are factors to how you want your car to corner and to ride. Okay? Alignment specifications being accurate makes your Corvette handle better. I can tell you firsthand. I had a Stingray come off the truck. The guy took it out and says, I don't like the way it handles. I was like, you have 70 miles on the car. Why don't you like the way it handles? It doesn't handle right. So I took it out. Sure enough, this thing, when you would go around a corner, it would bump sideways. It would literally jump sideways. He had the magnetic ride control. He had the Z51. So this car should not have done this. Took it up, put it on the alignment rack. Sure enough, the alignment spec was off because there was a slightly loose fastener. Don't know where it happened, don't know how it happened. Reset his alignment, he went to Lime Rock the next weekend. Lime Rock is a road course where the ALMS runs. He had fun. But it's everything. The details make the difference. I can tell you, the majority of you, if you haven't had your alignment checked in one year, it's probably off. I can almost guarantee it. I recommend to all my Corvette owners to check your tire balance and wheel alignment once per year. If you're going to the track, I want to see that car before it goes to the track because I am going to give you an alignment that's going to make it handle like it's on rails. Then when you get back, I want it back to bring your tires vertical so that they don't wear the tires out prematurely. Wheel alignment can be everything. Yes, sir. We will talk about premature wear once we're all set with this, okay? All right. Sway bars. This is off an actual fifth gen. This is your base ride suspension. This is your Z51. That diameter is less than a half inch. But it made a big difference on fifth gen when you were trying to modify it. Sway bars make a big difference. Obviously, we all know that Z51, Z06, they're all bigger diameter. Basically make your corner better. Alignment readings. Back to your point, sir. Okay. Caster numbers greater than zero increase high speed stability. An example is 3.0 is not as stable as 7.0 at higher speeds. The higher the speeds, the more caster you want. Excuse me, that's why we see ZR1 with 8.5 degrees of positive caster. Camber is the tilt in at the top of the tire. Another reason why I brought my family neighborhood tire with me. Okay? Let's say I'm the front of the car. Let's say your engine, that's okay. I knew that was going to happen. Let's say your engine's over here. So if you're tilted like this, that is called negative camber. Whereas on the inside shoulder of the tire, that's what you have on your 6th gen, sir. All Corvettes from, 2000, from 1997 to present date have negative camber tuned into them. Now, base ride was only 2 tenths. But if you had Z06, 1.2. I'm exaggerating the tilt, but you get my thought. Okay? Now... Zero creates neutral handling with optimal tire wear. Zero means straight up and down. That's all it means. So if you're experiencing tire wear, I want to know where my camber is. Okay? I want to know that my camber is at zero. Because this is not, unless you're tracking the car, going to zero camber is not going to hurt you. In fact, it will extend the life of your tires. How many of us want to spend about $300 a tire? How about Stingray at $600 a tire? Not for nothing? I want to make sure those tires are, can last as long as possible. Thereby, where I come in, Mr. Service Technician, and I supply you with an alignment printout afterwards so you know exactly where your alignment is. 0 0.5 negative would increase cornering response but will wear on the inside tire shoulder. Once again, the engine's here, negative 0.5, okay? More pressure is on the inside of the tire, okay? But 
It's going to make you handle a lot better on the track. Skeet knows. He's already done it before. Yes, sir. What's the spec camber on a branch fork 110? 1.2 negative. That is the reason why Grand Sports wear out their tires more. Z06 wears out their tires more. But you take a Z06 on the track, there ain't nothing going to beat it. Because the camber is negative 1.2. So when I get my car lined to spec, I'm still going to get negative 1.2 unless I tell them set it at zero. Unless you request them to set it at zero. That is correct. Thank you. Very, very smart. Very astute. Yep, 11,000 miles on a Grand Sport is about average if you leave it at factory tire spec. But the outside shoulder looked just fine. Hey, Goodyear gave me new tires, too. Well, you, got, you, were, you were very, very lucky with that one. I got four new tires for $500 for a Grand Sport. <laughs> Next question! <laughs> But ladies and gentlemen, I mean, that's an extreme example. And admittedly, I've never heard about them warranting tires like that. I mean, congratulations, sir. That's really great. And it's obvious that your Goodyear and your dealership took good care of you. They did. That, I mean, because that's a $2,000 bill, sir. Yeah. That's a $2,000 bill on a GS. Okay? And everybody's nodding their head because somebody's been taken. No, right? I, I had it realigned. They said, you're right on spec. Well, now I know. I was at negative 1.2 on camera. Yeah, Z06 Grand Sport, they're all at negative 1.2, ZR12. So, yeah, this is all part of that. Toe setting, make sure that the, toe setting, make sure that the tr car, tires track the car correctly when making steering input. Basically, it's where my steering wheel is going, okay? Now, you always want a little bit of toe in, always a little bit. Usually, positive 0.05 to 0.10, which is factory spec. You can stay with the factory spec on toe settings. I want to stay there, okay? This gives you precise turn-in response, but it also gives you trackability. So you're not having to constantly make corrections. You got me? So that's really what you want to do with that. You know, and we talk a lot about tires. The reason why I focus on it so much, ladies and gentlemen, that's a lot of money. Yes or no? You see what I'm saying? So we want to help keep you at your absolute best. We want to make sure that we get the maximum life out of your tires. We want to make sure that you can handle on rails on the track. We want to make sure you can do everything. But that requires knowledge from, your own, from the owners as far as to what to tell your service technician to do. But if you got somebody like me, they're going to tell you what to do. Because they're going to know what's going to be best for you and your particular characteristic of driving. It's that simple. No, as far as the caster rating, now, that's a good point. And let's be very clear about this. Caster numbers are for the front only, except on Stingray. Remember, on Stingray, we now have caster on the rear, too. Okay? That requires a special tool that we use called an inclimeter. In inclimeter? Uh, okay, fine. We'll take that. Um... But that particular tool, you'll never get a printout on, okay, guys? Uh, that is something that we set at 2 degrees, okay, for the caster in the rear on Stingray only. 2013 and prior, the caster was only on the front, okay? Camber is all four wheels, okay? That's all four wheels, all right? But the camber is at all four wheels, and the toe is at all four wheels. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So if you go to zero, you're, I think you're going to do well. I'm going to take this lady over here and then over to you. Yes, miss? Is that camera information in our, in our manual? No, that will not be in your manual. That will be in the factory service manual. And I, 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 I thank so much Mid-America because they actually came out here and they gave me the four-volume set of the 2013... Manuals. Now, I know I am not going to read you them all, but what I will do is I am going to go over here, and in this book, 
you're going to have this is actually suspension wheels and tires but as far as what we do wheel alignment specifications every service manual that we have no matter what it is this is where we're at okay this is what we use and this is what we reference and you can see camber caster toe then on the rear you have your camber and your toe this is for 2013 okay but you can see that your suspension options and your tire options change negative 1.2 Negative 1.3, okay? That's FE4, FE5. That's basically ZR1, okay? But ladies and gentlemen, things change. You have a different suspension design. You change your alignment specs, okay? Now, that does not change my recommendation to go to 0.0, .0 on camber because 0.0, .0 on camber will give you much, much better tire wear over time, much better. Okay? And that's the reason why we talk about that. So is that kind of a better answer for you? And ladies and gentlemen, when you get a wheel alignment, get yourself a confirmation printout afterwards. Every alignment shop, dealership, aftermarket, does not matter. They can supply you with a printout. Get the printout. But ask them before you go in. Say, listen, I keep my records. Please get me a confirmation printout of the before and the after specs. And then that will help you get up there. Now we move on to comfort. Wheel alignment can change the comfort of how you drive and the ride of your vehicle as well. Ladies and gentlemen, if your wheel alignment is not set where it needs to be, you could get a really harsh ride. How many people have a car that does this when it gets into the ruts on the highway? Kind of does this. Did you know if you bring your camber to zero, it will reduce that tendency? Because think about it. You've got a rut in the road. It's going to want to follow the corner, right? Now, if you're like this, the entire tire is over the rut. You're not going to want to follow it as much now, are you? Simple physics, right? 0.0, .0 camber will do much more than just prevent tire wear. It'll also make it track easier. Less corrections when you're in those ruts that the tractor trailers make. Right? Okay, yes, sir. What's the camber set on the C7 with the Z51? Still up there. Uh, I think it's negative one or negative, negative 0.7. Admittedly, I've only done three, so I apologize for not knowing it off the top of my head. Uh, well, normally I do, and, and I apologize, but um, I know it's in the negative. It's over negative 0.5. So regardless, but let's remember, on Stingray, we're talking about a softer compound tire here. Those Michelin Super Sports are excellent tires. Oh, my God, I love them. But they're also a softer compound. Yeah, he's wagging his head. He's like, oh, yeah, man, I love those. Things. But the point is, is that they're softer compound, so they're going to wear out faster, Okay. So let's be clear on this. So a proper alignment spec, uh, a proper alignment settings are critical to tire life. Okay, so that's where I would still go to 0, 0.0. I did it on uh, gentleman Richard Jakonski. He had a um, he got a museum delivery. He one of the one one of the raffles stingrays, and uh, he brought it back and uh, and we did we did the entire alignment over, and he was like it's night and day. He's like I love it. I absolutely love it. So your alignment technician will know the best way to really serve you. And the key thing is, communicate your needs. Tell them what you want. I want a better ride. I want to extend the life of my tires. But now we go on to seating. How many people think of seats as a safety factor, as a safety uh, system? Yeah, some do, but most don't. No, but they are. Seating is a safety system because think about it. Where does your seatbelt bolt you down to? Yeah. Straps you right into your seat, right? Fact is, is that proper posture and proper seating in any car will help protect you in the event of an accident. You see the seats that are sagging. You see the seats that aren't creating uh, the right posture. You know, you should really be set with your thighs supported. 
You know, get yourself nice and set. You want that comfort level because comfort means safety as well. If your seafoam is more than five years old, it may not be as comfortable as long drives. Seating surfaces and foam play a critical role in how comfortable you are when driving. Lumbar support and side bolsters help support your back correctly when sitting for long periods of time. This is the part. Lateral support on the sides, lumbar support in your mid-back and your thigh support all create a correct seating position so that in the, air, in the interest, uh, in the event an airbag deploys, sixth generation, you got that side impact bag that comes out, all of these things have a factor in how you are in the vehicle. <coughs> Stingray has knee bolster airbags. The boys, so that your knees don't take the hit when you come forward. Excellent system, works very well. Five star frontal crash tests on Stingray. I'm all about it. But seating surfaces are all part of this factor. So if you guys get uncomfortable on long rides, you may want to be looking at your seating surfaces and trying to change that to make it better for yourself. 